amazing conference so far, hasn't it? Yes? And how many of you feel that the speakers before me have done an excellent job so far at the conference? A round of applause for all of them. Great, so I'll take some time to set all this up. This is me. This is one of my first confessions to start with. And for the first thing is to connect the HDMI cable. OK, so while I get all this thing done, a number of speakers before me talked about the concept of safe environments. So how many of you feel that this is a safe environment? I'm still trying to figure out how this thing comes up onto the stage. Anyway, and how many of you feel that this place is a psychologically safe environment, not just an earthquake safe environment? <laughs> okay, I would need some help here, folks, to get this thing done. Oh, there it is. Wow, yay. And I'll have to figure out extra hard, thanks to my amazing first time presentation skills to go right to the right, and that present button isn't showing up. Anyway, so... <laughs> yeah. Did I click it? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yay. Great, thank you so much. So th this is what you need to do to a first-time speaker all the time. Learn from me, uh, and learn from yourself. Okay, so when I talk about confessions, I stand here as a person who has sinned in certain ways. Uh, they're not technically sins, but then I'm not proud of them. And I see this entire place lit up like a church or something like that. And I look at all of you as priests and priestesses. Uh, hopefully by the end of this conference, or by the end of this talk, I would be asking for forgiveness, and hopefully you should forgive me. Uh, if I forget to ask for forgiveness, please remind me. <laughs> Remember, I'm a first-time speaker. So, this talk is not about DevOps. How many of you have heard of this word before, DevOps? <laughs> Beautiful. I heard about it like last month uh, while I was preparing for this. And this talk, I, I know I've, there, this room is filled with a number of folks with whom I am working or I worked with who know some of the gory secrets of what I've done and who are waiting in glee or anticipation that Mrinal would be out there talking about the time when I screwed up a prod database, or I checked in a password in source control. Uh, no, I will not be talking about those. Uh, well, having said that, I thought I would start this confession after a few slides, but then I started already. Um, anyway, never mind. So this is not about accidents. This talk is not about accidents. This talk is about planned blunders, blunders which I did, and I see people around me doing, knowing fully well what they are trying to do. A number of you before this conference have asked me that, why do you even have to do this? Um, why do I have to come up here onto this podium and put a knife through my belly and turn it around? Uh, why do I have to damage my credibility out here in front of this amazing audience? My answer to that is that there is a concept of learning. When we talk about DevOps, we talk about learnings. We talk about sharing. Uh, before me, Teresa came in and talked about the CAMS model, and the S stands for sharing. And with this talk, hopefully, I'm coming in and living up to those values of DevOps about sharing not only successes, but also failures and blunders. I believe this also resonates with the theme of this conference. How many of you even remember what's the theme of this conference? A show of hands. Really? <laughs> what's the theme of the conference, Peter? Retro. retro or retrospective, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it, it resonates with that theme, and that's the reason I'm doing it. Another thing which is, oftly, which is often missed out is the concept of why is this even happening? What is the situation which is driving to these blunders. We are presented with situations every day in our lives wherein we have the option of choosing multiple paths, and we choose one path. That path could be the right or wrong, um, but then we are in that situation in the first place. So what are the situations we end up in? 
So perhaps we should keep an eye on some of those aspects as well. And if you forget to look at those aspects, I'll remind you anyway. I'll be talking about just three confessions. I'll be talking, I mean, I've done a lot of mistakes in my life, personal aside. Uh, in the DevOps side, I'll be just talking about three. So I won't take a lot of your time. This is an agile story format. <laughs> Thanks to Katrina for suggesting this option. Uh, this is also an example to show that speakers actually talk to each other and learn from each other. Um, again, as a speaker, always remember that there are other speakers there to help you. The another advantage, I mean, not only this is, is this a very nice way of explaining what I'm trying to do, but then it also allows me to automate it at some point of time. <laughs> so you could have it as confession as code, if you will. OK, here's come the monkey slides. Uh, I'm known for doing monkey slides. Uh, and these are not clicked by any of my friends. Uh, so uh, Alison, I would love to have some of your friends to do this for me. Um, so yeah, so there are multiple ways to look at this talk. You can laugh at it, which is fine. Uh, you can laugh at the slides, which is absolutely wonderful. I like that. Uh, but then you can laugh at the sins as well and the confessions as well. That's one way of looking at it. Another way is to be a bit more thoughtful towards it. So while I talk, you can think about similar situations which you may be currently in, similar situations which you may have been in, similar situations which you see your colleagues in. Think about it. That's all I ask for. Just think. You may laugh as well. So the first one, one-track DevOps. Now, a bit of background about myself. I come from an infrastructure background. Uh, it has been a lot of ops, a lot of infra, a lot of support, a lot of build and release. Um, and coming from that background, I mean, initially, I, I used to be in a place wherein I did a lot of manual installation of the IBM WebSphere stack on servers. There are a few friends of mine out here who have worked with, the, with me during that time as well. And believe me, I was even paid for doing that job. <laughs> paid quite well, in fact. Uh, after some point of time, I realized that, yep, there are automated tools which can do that job. It was great, so now I could realize that there is a value in it. And it made me look cool, that, hey, you know some of these amazing ways of working. I longed for that recognition as well. And that roughly coincided with the time when DevOps started becoming a thing. And then as uh, Teresa in, my, in, her, in, her, in her talk before me talked about DevOps being looked at as something which is the ops folks being finally, finally invited to the party. So I could relate to that. I heard a lot of Agile around me. I was like, this is exactly what I want. DevOps means automated config management, infrastructure as code, automated build and release, and better ways of working, pipelines, and the jazz. That was what my understanding of DevOps was. Clearly, if you have been listening to these talks in this conference, that was not a very good thing to start with. But that was my assumption. So clearly, it was a case of mistaken assumptions. I was pretty sure what I was doing is DevOps. Uh, in hindsight, perhaps it wasn't a good idea anyway. Why? So we were in situations like I, I also had that brand of a DevOps engineer. So I, I'm quite happy that Teresa spoke just before me. She, you elucidated some of these points beautifully. And it, you make the job a lot easier for me. I was quite, quite unhappy, in fact, that I'm speaking on the second day. I, was, I should have spoken on the first day. I should be you know, tension-free a lot earlier. But now, in hindsight, I'm quite happy that you spoke before me. So, uh, so I was a DevOps engineer. I went into projects. And as soon as I went there, I looked for places which gives me the low-hanging fruit, which is automate that infrastructure. That was the easiest thing for me to do. I was good at it as well. I, I, I admit I was good. Ah, and I could look into the problem, look at places where I could start automating and get those low-hanging fruits, ah, get those short-term wins, get that recognition that, Mrinal, you are amazing. Ah, I am, in a way. Ah. <laughs> Come on, don't laugh at it. So some of these things which happened was, of course, I started learning a lot of these tools. So I don't want to use this conference to talk about some of the tools which I worked with. Uh, but then you know the likes. Um, one tool is better than the other, one competitor is better than the other, and you start playing around with a lot of these tools. And I, sooner or later, I saw my resume. There was a column of tools, and uh, looked pretty cool. 
And then things started happening. I noticed that there were developers, there were testers, uh, and there was the ops. And we ended up running on our own separate tracks, just like how these athletes were. And we just talked to each other when we wanted to integrate with each other. Apart from that, there was no conversation. It was like you're doing your stuff. Typical pattern. The problems of some of these approaches is that I became, started becoming the bottleneck. Now, I just knew everything about infrastructure. And when I say I, it was me and a group of similar folks who formed a sub-team of our own. And we knew everything about the infrastructure build release parts. No one else knew anything about it. So if I am sick or if my team is out of action, if they attend DevOps days, no one is at work. I mean, they don't know what to do. Uh, we talked about silos, the DevOps silo, the classical DevOps silo. So I am guilty of that aspect as well. That it starts becoming like that. You do your own stuff. You are playing around with all your infra tools. The business never likes these type of things. Now, the interesting things used to happen, like the business used to attend some of these conferences, like the ones which you are attending, the, the Agile conferences, the DevOps conferences. And they were talked, they, they heard a lot about DevOps. They thought DevOps is the silver bullet, which will solve all their problems. So they go back to their workplaces and say that, hey, we need a DevOps engineer. Not one, we need two. DevOps engineers like tomorrow. And a guy like me comes in, um, who is just focusing on the infrastructure part of it. And once you do that, they realize that earlier it used to take months to get infrastructure. So now at least we have got it down to hours and minutes. But then the testing effort is still not there yet. So maybe they have tests, but those tests, they are not quite, you know, the, at least the automated checks, the binaries which you are referring to. Um, even they, those binary checks were not done by a machine. It was done manually. So now we are in a position wherein we, are, we have deployed to a production, but then we are not moving the feature flags away uh, because you know, it takes three days to test it. Perhaps we don't even have feature flags to start with. So the business was expecting quick results. They were expecting some real good answers, but they weren't. So the short-term wins were there, but at a long-term holistic picture, they were not getting the business value they were looking for. Of course, it leads to stress. Uh, stress in the sense that, coming to that point, that if you are the bottleneck, you are the only person who gets informed or paged when things go wrong. You are the only person who is blamed. I've come across a word these days which is around blame-driven development, which is quite interesting. Yeah, it works. It's a thing as well. Um, so you, you start blaming people, and that blame you know, sooner or later comes to you. And the lack of and that expectation management, and, and you, you start losing the trust of the business as well, and that adds on to that stress. So these were some of the consequences which ended up with that one-track-minded DevOps approach. How to fix it? So one way to fix it is to hire a convertible, go to the South Island, and go for a drive. I was kidding. This slide is basically around taking the team on a journey. Uh, the, the idea is... There is no single DevOps engineer in the team. It is a DevOps team. The QA person or the dev or the person who is the so-called developer cannot say that, well, that infra guy or the infra person is the DevOps person. The entire team should associate themselves with that tag. Otherwise, it's useless. There is absolutely no point. Trust me, I have burnt fingers on it. Expectation management is important. Um, you, I mean, it, it's, it's all nice to say that, yeah, you can coach a team and take the team on a journey, but then do you have the mandate for doing it? Ah, a lot of times, if you, if, you, if you start doing some of those coaching aspects, and if you, it, it could backfire in a really bad way if, you, if expectations aren't set with the team, that, well, your job is or your role is to not only help get business value in a, in a proper way or in a standard, reliable way, but also to help coach the team to get to that place. So if you do not have that expectation set, again, you are lining yourself up for failure. It's a really bad political situation you'll end up in, or at least I ended up in. It's an absolutely fine expectation that the team comes in and says that, hey, Mrinal, it's fine. We just want you to focus on the infrastructure bit and ensure that it's top class. It's a very valid expectation. And it's also another expectation that please go ahead and ensure that we are delivering value. Off, forgotten, uh, but something which I really 
I'm starting to work on now is about learning to go to move outside your comfort zone. Uh, I may not be the best automation, automated test engineer. I may not be the best person for critical thinking. But perhaps I, should, I could learn or I could get inspired by people who are doing that. I could talk to them. I could try and say that, hey, let me try out something. Let me submit a pull request. Can you please review it? So this learning aspect is something which I, in my experience so far, I see quite diluted out here these days, where everyone is on their one-track journey. So you could either be a good test automation engineer, or you could be an amazing developer with the, bit, with the latest JavaScript technologies under your belt, but then you may not be uh, even thinking holistically. This is a quote which I really believe in. Um, it is about a lot of us going for individual glory. Uh, that is, again, short term. It will come and hit us quite, quite hard at the end. And a lot of this behavior is driven by the education we get from as well. Uh, when we are in school and college, uh, we are graded on our individual scores. Uh, in, in our appraisal cycles, in, our, in, our, in the places where we work, we are graded on our own individual performance. Are you a stellar performer? Are you like on a scale of one to five? How good are you? And that is when you start thinking about that, hey, I need to project myself as the stellar performer. So you start going in for short-term wins. So there's a bit of an HR thing going on as well. And perhaps this should allow us all to introspect that how are we appraised at our workplaces as well? What is the behavior that is making us move forward? So yeah, so this is basically a summary of it. Uh, I filled up that template so that one of us could automate it at some point of time. I'll I'll take some time for all of you to have a quick look at it. Again, slides would be shared, so you don't need to write it down. Okay, so we move on. The second one is MVP-driven DevOps. And by the way, I'm not sure whether you're, some of you are able to see there is a small Twitter handle out there on the bottom right corner. Uh, so that is, a, that is something which we created a few days back to test how it all works. So I would be quite happy to listen to some of your confessions as well. Perhaps I could take the liberty of putting up a DevOps confession open space to have people come in and talk about some of these things. I don't want to be alone out here, folks. Be with me. So MVP-driven DevOps. How many of you know what MVP is? Show of hands. And any one of you? Oh, everyone. So everyone knows about it. So MVP is, what does MVP mean? Alan? Most valuable player. Most valuable player. <laughs> Amazing. You can depend on Alan for such things. <laughs> Minimum viable products. That's what the books say. Um, again, a bit of background. All my professional career, I was working on delivery projects. So when I say delivery, it is more about greenfield, starting from scratch, and people saying that we need stuff to be delivered on production, usable by our customers like yesterday. Ah, so that is the standard requirement all the time. And that speed leads to behaviors, and that, that, that stress always in you that we have to push things out as soon as possible. And somewhere around the line, I came across this word MVP, and it resonated with me that, well, this is like an amazing concept. So this basically gives me the liberty to cut corners, for that matter. Ah. So you start cutting corners. And, and we all, I mean, a uh, number of speakers before me talked about some of these aspects. So I will not, I'll spare you the, 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 the trouble to talk around some of those problems. But at a very high level, it adds on to the technical debt. Folks know what technical debt is? Again, show of hands. Good. A bit of exercise is always good to raise hands once in a while. It, 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 it helps. The blood moves along. It helps. OK, so technical debt. So you do something quickly. Uh, in, the, in the name of MVP, you create an architecture which is somehow it works. And you think that, yep, this is fine enough. It's perhaps an internal release, so we can re re release it as an MVP. And there are things which have been done out there, passwords checked in, fine. I wasn't joking earlier. Um, it's fine. We can fix it in the next sprint. And that next sprint never happens. So we are all aware about that as well. Uh, security is something which is often compromised. So is the code which I'm churning out good enough to go and sit in a public domain? Is it pen tested, basic compliance audits done? Um, 
I have seen, and I have done it, and I have seen these things happen all the time. That that uh, under the guise of MVP, and un, un, I mean, pre pretty horrible code starts moving out to the final stages. It's quite an untidy room, and it is not my room. Uh, I, it, it is just a stock picture, not not something which I know of. So this is basically more of untidy code. Uh, so again, code written under the guise of MVP ends up, which is not quite golden standard. It is not a code which you would feel proud of. Uh, you would feel, in fact, embarrassed that that code was actually out there in the public and it has your name associated to it. Uh, but then these are standard paradigms or the standard structures which we see when people do strange things in the name of MVP. Of course, there are problems to it. So one of them is being delays. Uh, delays because of the technical debt. Uh, I have been in situations there are people Perhaps there are people in this room as well who are, as we speak, fixing some of the defects which came out as part of MVP, which were written by me. So they are having sprint and sprint upon activity to fix some of those things. Um, of course, the business doesn't quite like delays. The business always focuses on business value being delivered, and they are like technical debt. Why do you even write code like this? Uh, uh, but but the, the underlying characteristic about all this is speed, and that is something which is often forgotten. Uh, security audits are another thing. So now you have code written on, in MVP, horrible pathetic code which is going out, and then there is a security scan or audit happens and your name pops up as one of those folks whose code sucks. Um, not a very nice place to be in. And then you cannot just argue that, well, this was MVP. I mean, this is not code which I really intended to be out there after six months, but then it still is there and your name is with it. You may not be on that project anymore. Ah, but then your name is still there for, for history to see. Again, you, are also risk, you also risk pushing out vulnerable code out there in the public domain. Um, not a good thing to do at all. And of course, all this leads to embarrassment. Uh, you don't want to be in this place at all. Trust me. How to fix some of these things? Um, so one thing which I learned from some of my colleagues out here is that there needs to be a minimum standard of engineering which you need to maintain as a developer. When I say developer, I'm saying any person who's coding. It could be the QA person, the infra person, because everything is in code these days. Even the documentation which you write, there needs to be a minimum standard. You do it for an MVP or you do it for a final product, it doesn't matter. There needs to be a minimum standard. And that is something which we need to take pains to at least identify and ensure that any code which I write will have a test case any code which I write would be modular. Any code which I write should be reusable by someone else. So that mindset needs to be there. And it doesn't happen easily. It happens with help from others. Um, and one of the ways to do that is through a peer review process. Often people think that a peer review is just a way to ensure that bad code doesn't accidentally go in. But this is also an amazing way to ensure that code which is, or any code or documentation written by you is following or adhering to the minimum standards which is required. I personally have gained a lot from people who are peer reviewing my code and learning from their insights. That, okay, you have written this, this works, amazing, but this could be written better. And that is when my typical uh, trends come in that, hey, you know, this is just a proof of concept we are doing. Why do you have to get into that level of detail? But then the thing comes in that even if it's a proof of concept, it is something which, are you proud of this code you have written? Is this something which someone else can start reusing? The end goal could be a proof of concept, but then that code could be reused in some other places as well. So it's imperative that we keep that in mind and focus on peer review as a way to help fix some of these problems. Coming back to that MVP, um, you can just go out and do a Google search for MVP on Google Images, and you'll see a typical thing like this, but then it would show just the first two rows. Uh, it's basically the way to demarcate how it differentiates from a waterfall model, wherein you're creating the wheels and then the car, which is not quite the right way to do in an agile world. And then in, a, in an agile world, you use the paradigm of a bicycle and a motorcycle and so on. You will see it a lot of times, but then this is what causes some of those problems as well, because you are re-architecting the solution after every sprint. 
I like the third way of doing it, wherein you actually have the bare bone structure of the final product with you. You're evolving the architecture, not re-architecting the architecture. I repeat, you need to evolve that architecture, not re-architect it. If you're evolving it, you don't end up in situations wherein, you know, with every, every sprint, you are spending time going through an architecture again, rewriting code, and so on. Again, the summary to automate it. I'll give you, I mean, I really shouldn't force you to read some of these things, but then be with me. Please read it. It's fine. Keep in mind that third clause, that because I was under pressure to deliver quick wins. So when I say that because, I'm not shifting the blame in any way to the people who are pushing me for it. But then if I end up in that position, wherein I am pushing someone to deliver something quickly, it is a note to me as an individual, and perhaps a note for all of you, there are leaders out here who would be at some point of time, or perhaps are even now pushing people to deliver wins. Are you, is, it, is it justified to push all the time? Because once you start pushing these things, once you're incentivized for delivering quick wins, that is when it drives these type of strange behaviors, which are typical anti-DevOps patterns or anti-patterns. Good, the last one, judgmental DevOps. This is something which I see pretty much everywhere, everywhere, everywhere I worked. Um, and it all stems from the fact that, you know, a typical story is that a, a few years back, I was working as part of a place uh, which had a team of good developers, ops, QA, uh, testers, not QA, uh, folks working together as part of a team, working very well, bringing down deployment times from hours to minutes. And now we are in a position wherein we are deploying to a dev environment and we have to talk to a third party system. And we start talking and we realize that, oh, there's a firewall rule which needs to be opened. And that has a three-day SLA. So you are stuck. So here you are working in minutes, and then there is a day's delay, which is sort of lined up. And, and it causes frustration. So I had a friend who used to say that, OK, how many of you, you know, have heard of cricket as a game? <laughs> Amazing. OK, good. Uh, so in cricket, there's a concept of 2020. Ah, and then there's a test match. So they say that we are, we are, we are playing 2020 and they are playing a test match. So how does it even, even work like this? Uh, so these delays causes behaviors. And the first thing which happens is being judgmental. Yeah. It's very easy to sit back and say that, hey, you know, that team sucks. They are playing a test match. And I see that happen quite a time, quite a long, quite a number of times. Um, there's also the blame culture which starts coming in. We talked about blame-driven development, and this is another example, wherein you say that, hey, you know, they, there's a delay, and this is not because of me, it is because of you. Not you. Uh, <laughs> and of course, the final thing is you start laughing at them as well. So typical coffee conversations, you say that, hey, that team, and I've seen this happen with uh, not only network teams in general, but also like release management is another thing. Uh, it could be some other disparate team with whom your product interfaces with. So it's very easy to you know, point the finger at someone else and laugh, judge, and blame. And, the, and, the, and what we get as a consequence is stubbornness. So once teams end up in this place wherein they are being accused of something, they get more and more entrenched into the ground. And they are like, well, I'm not moving anymore. This is the SLA. Live with it. If you have a problem, talk to my manager. And that manager, you go and talk to him or her, and they say that, well, that is how the rule is set. That is the SLA, so can't help it, so suck it up. I have been told that in New Zealand, you need to have a rugby slide. <laughs> so this is my obligatory rugby slide, so this shows conflict. Uh, conflicts happen. So when we end up in situations like this, when, when you are constantly judging someone, it is not hidden anymore. It, is, it comes out into the open sooner or later. It shows in your body language. And when you start fighting, it shows in, it has manifestations. You don't talk personally, you talk in emails. Yeah. You have escalations. Your managers talk to each other more often. And then I have been in situations wherein I spend half my day writing emails and carefully drafted emails with paragraphs and all, uh, with right punctuation and grammar and everything just to ensure that everything is fine. So, so I spend a lot of time doing some of these idiotic things rather than actually working on code, which I really want to. How to fix this? One of the ways is with empathy. When I say empathy, I mean 
Have we even tried to understand what is causing that three-day SLA? I'm using the network team just as an example here. Have we, have we tried to speak to them? Have we tried to see what their motivations are? Have we tried to see what their concerns are? In this case, in this network team thing, I realized that when I spoke to that person in charge, he said that, well, I have to raise a request, and then that request needs to be approved by someone in the security team. Then it has to be approved by a person in a config management team. And then it has actually implemented by a person sitting offshore in some other country. And then it actually come back, it, it comes back, there are validations, and after the validations are done, it is marked as done. In light of all this, I was quite impressed that they still have a three-day SLA. If I was there, it would have been more. So once you start empathizing, that's when you realize what their boundaries are. Another aspect about empathy is about how many of us are privileged to attend such conferences. All of us sitting around here are privileged. The places where we work, or perhaps the salaries we earn, is enough for us to attend some of these conferences. Many of us aren't that privileged. Perhaps it's our duty in that sense to try and empathize with them, try to understand what their problems are, and collaborate with them to try and find a solution, to find common ground. So the final thing again, a uh, summary of this last confession. Again, the third point, because I wasn't receiving the support I was expecting, not putting the blame on anyone, but perhaps is this a way to put in something that, what if my design knew that this thing would happen? What if I was aware that there is a three-day SLA? Can I design my system better? Can I try and find out some of these dependencies earlier so that I can plan for it in the proper time? Anyway, so I'm winding up towards the end of my presentation. So we talked about a number of confessions. Uh, we talked about the reasons for it, for some of them. We talked about some of the characteristics. We talked about the consequences. I also talked about some of my learnings. Now on that learnings part, these are things which have worked for me. These are things which work based upon my personality traits. It works, upon, it works based upon the number of the teams I was working with. So their personality traits, their experience levels. It may or may not work for you. So at best, you should take it as guidelines. Um, but I would love to hear how you are solving some of these problems. I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one who has confessed to some of these things. You may not confess, but you know that you have seen something like this happen as well. I would love to know how you have handled it. Alison, in the talk before, talked about how she was doing some of the cross-training within her teams, and that is something which I was really inspired from. Um, anyway, so that's, what, uh, that's all I have. So I am confessing to all these skins. Do you forgive me? Okay, good. This is, uh, you have been an excellent audience. Thank you so much. Goodbye, God bless.